So if you saw my email earlier, you saw that this week, just taking a brief break from John's Gospel, and I'll have you turn with me. It's kind of hard for me to pick like an anchor passage this week, because we're going to be doing a little bit of uh, sword drilling. <laughs> if you've ever been to like, you know, Christian school or Christian camp, you know, sword drills are. So we're going to be kind of going in some other directions as well, but I guess we can anchor down at 1 Corinthians 11 for the time being. 1 Corinthians 11. This passage is probably familiar to a number of you, especially since once a month we read a portion of this passage. Well, m- not once a month, but once every few months we'll do 1 Corinthians 11 and the foundation for our communion celebration. And, you know, I thought to myself that in the time that we've been a local fellowship, I can't remember a time, and I actually asked a couple of people, I said, did I ever actually preach a message on the foundation for communion, why we celebrate it the way we do? And from a couple of people, I said, no, I can, basically I can't remember that. And I said, I don't think I have. So that is my text, and that's my focus this morning, communion, an examination of its creation, continuation, and custom. Now, the justification for the manner of our celebration is really what I'm trying to drive at here, and the reason why is because I'm convinced that one of the most unproductive things that one can do in seeking to live in a God-glorifying way is performing a religious activity with no understanding as to where the custom practice has come from, nor why, why one is even doing it in the first place. It's just that thing we do, right? We all take a shot glass of grape juice and a little piece of bread, and we down it, and, you know, we do this to remember the Lord, but why do we do it that way? And quite honestly, I think that in some instances, this can become a recipe for dead formalism, and even life-destroying legalism, both of which can produce God-scorning apathy in the case of dead formalism, right? Yeah, I don't really need to do that, whatever. Or God-defying libertinism. And you know what I'm talking about if you're somebody who grew up in a house where the fist was really hard on you about having to do your religious duty to God. And, you know, when you got to your teenage years, you said, nobody's ever given me a justification for why I do this. We just do it. And my parents look miserable half the time they're doing it. So why am I doing it? And then you end up leaving whatever faith you thought you had and living your own life and sowing your wild oats. And we know the rest of the story. Some of us have similar stories even in this room. So it's not just unproductive, but I actually think it could be dangerous spiritually dangerous when we engage in practices and activities that we say we're doing in the name of the Lord and yet really have no idea why we're doing it. Or at least it can be dangerous. And it also can lead to a kind of an ignorant form of, you know, this is kind of a buzzword today, but this kind of tribalism, right, that insulates itself from scrutiny for it will breed insecurity in its practice. That's how we always do it. Why are you questioning that? Who are you to judge me? So in contradistinction to blindly doing the will of a God you don't really know, or seeking to do the will of God whom you do know with no real direction from that God, I think the scriptures are replete with examples of God's people being commanded to commemorate milestones of the Lord's blessing and faithfulness in the lives of his people for the purpose of continuing faithfulness to future generations. You know, to give you an example, in Exodus chapter 12, you don't have to turn there, but Exodus chapter 12, verse 25 to 27, we see just one of these questions when God instituted the Passover, the Passover festival for his people Israel. And he says this, quote, And when you come to the land that the Lord will give you, as he has promised, you shall keep this service, the commemoration of Passover on a yearly basis. Now get this, And when your children say to you, What do you mean by this service? See, we got the question there. And the kids in here, you know what I'm talking about, right? You may not have actually ever asked your parents why you do the things you do and why you gather here on a Sunday, for instance. But it may be in your mind. And we as parents are commanded to instruct you in the faithfulness of God and the reasons why we do the things and don't do the things that we do and or don't do. As Moses goes on to say under the direction of the Spirit of God, you shall say it is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover. For he passed over the houses of the people of Israel in Egypt when he struck the Egyptians but spared our houses. So remember, And in fact, even to this day in Jewish homes who celebrate Passover, the idea is is that when you partake in the celebration, you are to place yourself in the position as if you were freshly coming out of Egypt yourself. And so there's there's that correlation between memory and participation. That's exactly what we see with the Lord's Supper, with communion. Commemoration and participation. So as I said, with this in mind, it 
dawned on me recently, and that's why I asked the question. I've never preached a message on the foundation for the ordinance, and I'm going to call it an ordinance here in contradistinction to sacraments, and I'll talk about that in a little bit, of communion and examination of why we celebrate it the way we do at Messiah Bible Church, where it doesn't just end normally. It doesn't just end with what we have at the table or the piano here. It's a table for now. Um, well, it doesn't just end there, but it continues on in the next room with fellowship with one another about breaking bread over a meal. Why do we do it that way? And quite frankly, it's probably long overdue. So and, and quite frankly, just, everything just seemed to kind of work. You know, we're in the Passover season right now, and we have our communion celebration today, which is rooted in that. It just made sense. We might as well do this today. So the objectives for the message, my objectives for this message are as follows. One, I hope to adequately explain the origin of communion biblically. Where, why this even is a thing, how it was instituted. Secondly, to examine its celebration and, quite frankly, its aberration throughout the history of Jesus' disciples, i.e. his church, and those who profess to be a part of his church. And then thirdly, to seek to root our observance that we observe here today in 2024 in Little Messiah Bible Church in the stream of biblical truth and history. And so that being said, like I said, this seems like a good anchor verse to start with. We're going to read again later. So I ask as you're able to stand, we're going to read 1 Corinthians 11, verse 23 through 26. And being as this is a more topical message in nature, this won't be as working with the original languages as other messages will be, but I still, my hope and prayer is that the, 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 the original context and meaning of these scriptures comes through quite clearly for all of us here this morning. So starting at verse 23, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was being betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke, in it, he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the death of the Lord until he comes. Lord, we've read your word. We pray that you would cause it to, to, to come down deep into our hearts and minds and to take root within our spirit and that we would walk away with a better understanding of what you have called us to commemorate, to celebrate, to remember, and to participate in as we look at this festival of communion that we celebrate here at this local assembly that you, by your own sovereign grace, have allowed to exist. May you be pleased with the rest of our service this morning, and we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. So now you might be upset with me, but I just told you 1 Corinthians 11. So if you've got one of them little handy ribbons, you might want to put that there. So I'm going to jump back to the gospel according to Matthew in Matthew 26. Matthew 26. And all four gospel accounts record for us an aspect of Jesus' last Passover meal with his disciples, which is that's what this was. If you look at chapter 26, verse 17, it says, Now on the first day, oh, I'll give you guys a second here to get to it. Matthew 26, verse 17. Sorry, I know I'm going kind of fast. But once you turn there and see this, you see this was the last. We just spent last week looking at the first Passover that Jesus celebrated in his three and a half year ministry. This is going to be the fourth and final Passover he's going to celebrate with his disciples. And in chapter 26, verse 17, it says, now on the first day of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus saying, where do you want us to prepare for you to eat the Passover? Right? So this was definitely a Passover meal. And there's every reason to believe because this is indeed rooted in redemptive motif when we talk about the creation of communion, it's rooted in this redemptive motif of God redeeming a people out of slavery. And if you're following along with the notes there in your bulletin, there's every reason to believe that the meal that's taking place here was a first century AD version of a Jewish Passover Seder meal, what we would call a Seder meal today. And why is it called a Seder? What does that word even mean? Well, Seder means order. And although the initial Passover celebration would be very simple, and in fact, if you went back to Exodus 12, verse 8, there were only three elements at the original Passover meals. Lamb, maror, which is bitter herbs, and matzah, which is unleavened bread. That's the three things that were present. By the time of Jesus, it had become an established, interactive, liturgical meal developed for what reason? Well, just like I said at the introduction, to assist 
in reminding the Jewish people of their redemption out of slavery in Egypt and encourage them, enforced by the law of Moses, to not forget what the Lord their God had done for them collectively as a people in redeeming them from the house of slavery. In Exodus chapter 13, verse 3, the Lord says through Moses to the people, Remember this day in which you went out from Egypt, from the house of slavery, for by a strong hand, Yahweh brought you out from this place, and nothing leavened shall be eaten. Leaven itself being, as we see biblically, a symbol of impurity, a symbol of sin. Only a symbol, okay? I'm saying it's wrong to eat, you know, all the sourdough bread you want, okay? But the point is, is that symbolically speaking, that's one of the reasons why it was kept out of the Passover festival, because leaven, or chametz, was a symbol of sin, all right? And what was the meat they were eating? Well, as I said, it was that of the Passover lamb that was required to be sacrificed and its blood applied to the doorposts and lintels of the Hebrew slaves living in Egypt's houses so as not to lose their firstborn to the angel of the Lord who was to deliver one last blow to the land of Egypt before the Pharaoh would let the children of Israel go. And I'm going back to Exodus chapter 12, verse 11 to 13. God says this through his prophet Moses, Now you shall eat it in this manner, with your loins girded, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It is the Passover of Yahweh. And I will go through the land of Egypt on that night and will strike down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. I am Yahweh. If there's any firstborn in here, maybe that hits you a little bit differently this morning. Thankfully, I was a middle child. And the blood, <laughs> that's terrible. I have to apologize to my sister later. <laughs> and the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And I will see the blood and I will pass over you. And there shall be no plague among you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. So our practice of communion is done in fellowship with one another, rooted in redemption from slavery, but a slavery of a different sort. As Jesus himself will say later in John chapter 8, if the Son has set you free, what? You are free indeed. And the Jewish unbelievers to whom Jesus was speaking misunderstood him and said, we've never been slaves of anybody, which is actually quite peculiar because as I already said, every single Passover season, it is drilled in the mind of the faithful Jewish person that you are to remember coming out of slavery in Egypt or you're to remember this story, the telling of the story as if it was done unto you. And if you don't remember it that way, even to this day in Jewish households, there is a sense where that person is understood to be not acting as a wise child, but as what? A foolish one, right? And so, if the Son has set you free, you are free. That's a, an amazing statement because you're not just free from physical bondage. You are free from the bondage to slavery, to sin. And there are a lot of us as believers that we need to embrace that truth. We need to embrace the truth that we are no longer to be characterized by the sins of our past if we've been set free from them. This is one of the problems that I know not only myself but other brothers in here is we've done ministry to people who have come out of alcohol addiction and drug addiction, other types of addictions. They go to step programs, which are well-meaning, no doubt, but they go to step programs that say you need to forever call yourself what? An alcoholic, a drug addict, a food addict, a gambling addict, whatever it might be. And the Bible says it's not pride to say, no, I'm not anymore. Yes, I once was this. I am no longer that. I have been set free by my Savior. And so he's given me all the requisite power I need to overcome every last sin in my life. Do you believe that? Because when you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, that's part of what you're proclaiming. That once you were a slave, now you are free. And you're not free because you released yourself from your own shackles. You're free because he did it on your behalf. Just as the angel of the Lord redeemed, e redeemed Israel out of bondage in Egypt. It wasn't their great idea. They cried out to the Lord and the Lord heard them. But it was part of God's providential plan. You see this all the way back in Genesis 15. When God said, your children are going to be slaves in a land not theirs for 400 years. I'm not going to release them yet because I'm waiting for the fullness of the sin of the Amorites to be completed. You see, God had all of this in plan. He was going to bring the land, the people of Israel, into the land that he promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob at just the right time. And we even see a parallel there to our own salvation, right? At just the right time, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who are under the law, that we might become the children of God, children of freedom. 
That's what that's supposed to signify, but I'm spending too much time on that point. I'll move ahead here. So it's the, the creation of communion is rooted in a redemptive motif, and it's realized in communal practice with one another. That's how it's realized. Now, it would be a mistake to assume, if you've ever been to a, 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 a modern-day Seder meal, we have one in our own home on a yearly basis, but of course from a Christian perspective because Jesus, our Messiah, has been, our Passover lamb has been sacrificed for us. But if you've been to any kind of traditional Seder meal, it would be a mistake to assume that everything going on today is as it went on in the days of Jesus. However, there are certain things that seem to have been most definitely present here that one can even see at Seder tables today. And this assists us in gaining a deeper understanding of the origin and establishment of our own communion observances today. So as we're in Matthew 26, look at verse 20 here with me, if you would, please. It says, Now when evening came, Jesus was reclining at the table with the twelve disciples. There is something called the Manish Tanah that's said in Passover meals on a yearly basis. Why is this night different from all other nights? And there's four reasons as to why. One of those reasons is all other nights we can either sit or stand while we eat, but on this night we recline, okay? Why do we recline? Well, because once we were slaves and now we are free. And we see Jesus and his disciples engaging in this same tradition. Now, tables back then wouldn't be like the tables we have in the other room here. These would probably be much closer to the floor and most likely in a U-shape, right? And then they would be reclining at table. And how they would do that in this instance, they would have a pillow maybe in front of the table and put their one arm like this and then take their hand and eat their food in this fashion, which is why when you read in John's gospel, it says that the disciple whom Jesus loved was leaning on the bosom of Jesus. That's how he could have done it and just kind of leaned back. He didn't say it before everybody, hey, who's going to betray you? Come on. No, he was leaning back and he probably most likely asked him in secret or, you know, probably in a hushed tone, Who is it that's going to betray you? You know, get Peter off my back. Who is it that's going to betray you? So they're reclining together, right? And the same ought to be for our own communion celebration today. This should be a celebration of our freedom in Christ, right? It shouldn't be something that is constricted to, well, make sure you only do it in this fashion or that fashion, or make sure you say these exact words. There's a certain freedom that ought to be evident in the celebration of communion that God has provided for us. Amen? I mean, that, that's what it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be a representation of that. So we recline in our souls because our Sabbath rest has been achieved by Messiah on our behalf. This is what the writer of Hebrews says in Hebrews chapter 4. So secondly, we have the washing during the meal. Now you don't have to turn there. <laughs> I'm going to say that a lot today. You don't have to turn there. But in John 13, we see Jesus taking this traditional practice of washing before at the start of the Seder and at the start of the meal portion, Jesus takes that tradition and adapts it and grants it a altogether new and also, I think, more impactful meaning. Because this wasn't just the tradition of washing hands before one eats. We looked at that amongst the Jewish people in John chapter 2, verse 1 to 11. No, this is going to be a sign and a symbol of how we are to be towards one another. And the communion table ought to remind us this as well. So during the Seder meal, one of the people present at the meal will provide the means for the guests to wash their hands both at the start and right before the main meal portion. That's according to Jewish halakha, or Jewish law. Now, Jewish, Jesus, I said, takes this tradition, transforms its significance by doing the most menial of tasks. This is the lowest of the low tasks that a servant could do of a household of that time, washing the dirty feet of his own disciples. And in John 13, 15 through 17, Our Lord said this, For I gave you an example that you also should do as I did to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a slave is not greater than his master, nor is one who is sent greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. So Jesus girds himself. We sang that in the song. Brethren, we have come to gather or come to worship, right? Christ himself will gird himself. And will disperse himself as the bread of life to all those around who have been made willing to receive him. He says that if I don't wash your feet, you have no part of me. He says you're all clean, but not all of you, right? There was one who wasn't clean. Even though he performed the ceremonial action of washing his feet, there was one who had not been made right with God. And we know that to be Judas. So in our celebration together, we are those who have been redeemed from sin's slavery and made ready to re-eat of the Lamb's last Passover as well. But quite frankly, there may be some even amongst us who don't truly know the Lord. Like Judas, they may be sitting in our midst 
And they think themselves saved because they had a religious experience. I'm not doubting the true nature of that experience. Don't get me wrong. Or, or that you actually experience something, I should say, right? But this is why we even do what's called fencing the table. This is why we take this very seriously. As much of a celebration it is, it's not for everybody. And there's been a big debate in the church over, especially amongst, if, if you're familiar with Solomon Stoddard and Jonathan Edwards and that whole debate between Jonathan Edwards and his father-in-law about who communion should be for. His father-in-law said it should be for everybody who comes into the established church. Edwards was adamant it should only be for believers. We would adopt that same view here as well. And in fact, if you went back to Exodus in chapter 12, verse 48 to 49, God himself gives certain restrictions. He says, no foreigner shall eat the Passover supper with you. The sojourner who joins themselves to the people of Israel, yes, but the foreigner, that's not for them. It's only for the children of Israel. And the communion table of our Lord is only for the children of God, those who have been made born again into a living hope. It's not for everybody. That being said, we go on in John, uh, Matthew's gospel in verses 21 to 23. We see the sharing of the elements of Passover, very communal in nature, right? And in fact, it's done in the context of pointing out that somebody's going to betray him from amongst his own disciples. And they ask, surely not I, Lord. And in verse 23, he says, he who dipped his hand with me in the bowl is the one who will betray me. Now, if we're not familiar with some of the some of the elements in the way the Passover dinner would be handled, we might think, okay, fine. Just wait till Judas dips his hand in the bowl with him and we're good. But that's not exactly how this would have taken place. So let me back up a little bit. In Seder meals today, the presence of matzah or unleavened bread, which is what we have before us here today for our communion meal, and maror or bitter herbs figure prominently and they're usually dipped together and eaten along with a sweet apple nut mixture which symbolize the mortar that the, that the Hebrews were forced to use to building bricks. Right? It's a bittersweet redemption out of slavery. Now, in Jesus' day, it seems that the meal was even more communal than it is in many homes today with the participants doing what? Dipping into the same dish and perhaps even the host supplying that then dipped pizza of matzah to the guests. And in fact, in John's gospel, that definitely seems to be the case where he says, the one I dip into the dish with and give, that is the one who betrays me. And it seems to be what is referenced when Jesus speaks of the one who is going to betray him since all the disciples present would have dipped into that same dish. And he's serving them as well. So all the disciples, therefore, what? They're fair game for being the one. That's why they say, surely not I. And by the way, if I could just say this as an aside, that ought to be our heart as believers, even as we come to the table, right? Wonderfully, uh, one preacher put it, wonderfully unimpressed with our own spiritual progress, right? We should never put it past ourselves that outside of the grace of God, we could be incapable of any sin, right? And I say that in a generalized kind of statement, Right? I mean, I, I don't think Christians can commit the sin of unbelief and therefore lose their salvation. But I think the import I'm trying to say is this, is that there should be a level of humility in which when we approach our Lord, we understand that but for the grace of God, every single one of us would fall away. It's he who maintains us. It's he who sustains us. It's he who keeps us in the body. We don't keep ourselves there. Our obedience is predicated on his acceptance and his sustenance. That's it. So they all would have shared together in these elements of the Passover meal. And nobody would have suspected Judas any more than they would have also suspected one another. Now, if you go to our main passage I have for us this morning, or what we anchored with in 1 Corinthians 11, this is the reason why Paul says in verse 27, Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. And that's why he admonishes, A man must test himself. And in so doing, he is to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself if he does not judge the body rightly. Now he's talking about believers here, but even still, God takes this service very seriously. He goes on to say in verse 30, For this reason, many among you are weak and sick, and a number sleep, which is a euphemism for Christians dying. They're asleep in the Lord. But if we judged ourselves rightly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are disciplined by the Lord so that we will not be condemned along with the world. And if I could just say this, if in your mind you have the attitude, well, yeah, uh, I might eat it wrongly, but the worst that could happen is I'd fall asleep. I'd still go to heaven. Just perish that presumptuous thought from your mind right now. True believers ought not to think in that fashion. 
we should never approach the Lord with that level of presumption. There is grace for that. Just confess it. Confess that evil thought to the Lord and repent of it, right? We should never look at it as in the spirit of a guy like Hezekiah. If you're familiar with the story of Hezekiah from the Old Testament, when he was shown that judgment was going to come upon his house because he got cocky in front of the Babylonians and showed him all his wealth, Hezekiah said, basically, when's this going to happen? Oh, not my lifetime? Okay. No, we shouldn't have that attitude, right? We should have the attitude that this day, right now, this moment, this second, we want to present to the Lord pure and holy lives without the leaven of insincerity and sin. But the, but, but the unleavened bread of sincerity and of truth, as Paul would later say as well, you know, or actually earlier in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. So all this to say, we may not be able to tell who the imposters may be among us. I'm not saying that they are. Don't misunderstand me. I'm not calling everybody salvation to question here. I mean, what, what authority do I have to do that anyway? I'm just saying that it is possible that there may be some like that among us, but one thing is for certain. The table of the Lord ought not to be approached in a haphazard fashion by any of those who claim to belong to him. And any who do are placing themselves in harm's way, for God will not be mocked nor treated as common or profane. Moving on here, we're getting near the end of the actual origin. We have the breaking of the bread. In verse 26, it says that he said a blessing, which is called the hamotzi in, 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 in Jewish homes today, a blessing over the bread. He broke it, gave it to his disciples and said, take it, eat. This is my body. This isn't just the bread of affliction, which is how it's remembered in Passover seders. This is actually more than that now. This is not only representative of that, but even more so, this is representative of my own body, my own body that's going to be broken and crushed for you. Now, it's hard to figure exactly when this is occurring during the Seder meal, judging by modern celebrations, but that matzah or unleavened bread was broken and distributed seems beyond debate. So about midway through the meal, and this is just, this is a possibility, guys. It's a possibility here, all right? About midway through the meal, the host of a Seder will take three matzot, that's three matzahs, that are arranged in a three-compartment napkin, okay? They'll take the one in the middle, they'll break it, They'll place the half back in the napkin arrangement and hide the other piece away, and that's called the afikomen, which is actually a Greek word which means after, sometimes dessert, they say, but really after. And it will be produced later and shared with the guests at the meal. This tradition's origin really is, quite frankly, somewhat shrouded in mystery, even amongst Jewish people today. Some believe, and this is kind of where I fall on this, some believe that it may have actually originated with early Jewish Christians as a nod to not only what Jesus is saying here, but also to his resurrection as well, as his body would soon be broken on their behalf. And then like that Afikomen piece I just mentioned, will be reproduced, in essence, raised again from the dead. Now, as I said, the matzah would no longer symbolize the affliction and resultant freedom from slavery in Egypt alone, but also the affliction and resultant freedom from sin in Messiah. And much like the Passover celebration that was commanded in order that the children of Israel wouldn't forget but remember God's redemption of Israel from slavery. So Jesus here says that this was to be done, what? In remembrance of him. That's what Luke has in his gospel. And that's how Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 11. I'm going to get to it here in a few moments. But this is one of the major reasons why we differ from our Roman Catholic friends. Because if you actually understand the origin of communion and where it comes from, its roots, you'll see that it would have been the farthest thing from the mind of our Lord and of his early disciples that, oh, what Jesus is doing here is giving us an extra sacrifice to, has to be reproduced every single week in something called the Mass. It's so foreign to even what, to what Jesus is instituting here, especially if you understand the origin of the traditions. So not just in remembrance, but in participation as well, in fellowship with his vicarious life and sacrificial death, just as the peace offerings of the Levitical sacrifices were shared by both priests and participants, so we share together in this with our Lord. When we break bread together, we signify our same fellowship that we enjoy in Christ, and as 1 Corinthians 11.26 says, as often as we eat this bread, we proclaim the death of the Lord until he comes. The same can be said for the cup, and that brings us to our next point, the partaking of the cup of redemption. Now, why do I call this the cup of redemption? Well, firstly, in the scriptures itself, it says, drink from this cup, verse 27, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Why? For forgiveness of sins. And then he even goes on to say, I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine, 
a common Hebrew expression used today in Hebrew prayers, especially at Passover. From now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. So we have this tradition that develops, especially, and we see this here in the time of Jesus, of drinking four cups of wine during the Passover meal. And those cups employed were employed in reference to God's promise of deliverance. So back in Exodus chapter 6, you have these I will statements of Yahweh towards the Hebrews as he was, as he was promising to bring them out of slavery. Now listen to this in verse 6. Say therefore to the sons of Israel in Exodus 6.6, 6, I am Yahweh, and I will bring you out from the hard labors of the Egyptians. I will deliver you from their slavery. I will also what? Redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. Then I will take you for my people and I will be your God. So the first cup, the I will bring cup, is that cup of sanctification. is what you start the meal with. The cup of deliverance, I will deliver. That's when we remember the plagues that God brought upon the Egyptians and delivered the Hebrews from them. And then this third cup here is most likely what Jesus is in reference to, or most likely what Matthew is referring to that Jesus is drinking and sharing with his disciples. And that is indeed is the cup of redemption. It's quite fitting concerning how he says that it's symbolic of his blood, which is what? Once again, poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins, even his blood of the covenant. And Luke actually adds the word new to this covenant. So what is this a reference to? Well, you go back to Jeremiah 31. Jeremiah 31, verse 31 says, Behold, days are coming, declares Yahweh, when I will cut a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not like the covenant which I cut with their fathers. In the day, I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. Well, which covenant would that be? Well, that would be the Mosaic covenant, the Sinaitic covenant, Exodus 19. My covenant, which they broke, but I was a husband to them. But this is the covenant which I will cut with the house of Israel after those days, declares Yahweh. I will put my law within them. And on their heart I will write it. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. And they will not teach again each man his neighbor and each man his brother saying, No, Yahweh, for they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest of them. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin. I will remember no more. By the way, that promise is still outstanding for the nation of Israel today, whom God has yet to bring about their full and complete salvation to. And we see that in Romans eleven twenty five to 29. But for those from the nations to whom this new covenant was also offered and instituted, the Gentiles receive the blessings of this new covenant as if they were natural born citizens of Israel. Because it is by grace we are saved through faith, not as a result of our works, not as a result of our ethnic background. We're saved by God's grace and his grace alone. And so this new covenant has been shared with you as well. Interestingly enough, Jesus here says that he's not going to drink this again. I do believe this signifies the finality of the shedding of his blood, a guarantee of full and free redemption from the slavery of sin and all those who are made willing recipients of it. So then it seems... Just to recap, before we move to the next point, this is going to go faster after this point. Communion, at its base level, is a symbolic eating of unleavened bread and wine, or as good Baptists, grape juice, in order to serve as a sanctifying reminder of what our Passover lamb endured to redeem us out of the house of spiritual slavery in a heightened continuation of, of the biblical thread of redemption, not to the replacement of the original feast, no, but in a deeper application of it. That's what communion is. That's why we do this. So anyone in here who's ever asked the question, why do we do this? This is why we do it. Now, we see in the early church, we see communion being celebrated in places like in the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 2, Verse 46 and 47. Acts chapter 2, you don't have to turn there, but 46 and 47. We see that the early believers were daily devoting themselves with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house. 
They were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord was adding to the number daily those who were being saved. Quite frankly, this is just my view on it, and I'm not alone in this. I think this is very likely an allusion to the fact that in the early church, what we do here on a monthly basis was not a new thing. In fact, they probably did it way more often, right? It was much more communal time, not like 21st century America, right, where we're running around from place to place, and unfortunately we all live like 40 miles away from each other, it seems sometimes, right? This is a different time. But when they came together to share meals together, it is most likely they also came together to remember the body and blood of our Lord. And in fact, we understand that what's going on here in the book of Acts, we see this also in Acts chapter 20, verse 6 to 12, when it says that the church man the first day of the week to break bread, possibly followed by a full meal as well, that that's exactly what's taking place. And this gets referred to as love feasts, quote unquote, love feasts. Now, by the time Paul is writing to the Corinthians in AD 55, that's where first Corinthians comes from. It seems that the church met for a common meal even before they took communion together. And the early church after the close of the New Testament seems to have continued this practice There's a passage in what's called the Didache, which is an early manual for Christians being baptized. In chapter 9, verse 5 to chapter 10, verse 1, it says this, But let no one eat or drink of your Eucharist, I'm going to explain the origin of that here in a second, except those who have been baptized into the name of the Lord, for the Lord has also spoken concerning this, do not give what is holy to dogs. And after you have had enough, give thanks as follows, with what follows being an after meal grace most likely accompanied by this communion celebration. Now, you heard me say the term Eucharist, and if you're coming from a Roman Catholic background, this term maybe sends a little shiver up your spine, okay? And I get that. The word Eucharist very simply comes from the Greek term Eucharisteo, which means to give thanks, okay? In reference to the way Paul uses it in giving thanks for the Lord. So that's all the Eucharist was at the beginning. When the Didache is written in the first centuries of the church, or we, we would put it this way, end of the first century, beginning of the second century, most likely, This idea of the body and blood being transmogrified or transubstantiated, I should say, into the actual body and blood of our Lord, I would argue didn't even, wasn't even on their mind. It wasn't even in their their mind at all. So the very early celebration was very much, it seems, in the same spirit of what occurred at the Passover, with possibly, with, with the only possible exception being this was happening more regularly, both sharing a meal and setting aside a portion of that meal to specifically call to mind Jesus' last Passover and what that Passover now signified, our communion as a household of faith. So what happened? What happened? If this, if this is how the early church understood this, what took place over history? Because even though some form of this kind of celebration continued in the early church, the ordinance and the meal together, an expanding church membership and quite frankly, disordered celebrating led to, disp- led to disdain of putting these two things together by the 4th century. And the established Roman church at that time prohibited the practice and excommunicated those who did it. Back in 1 Corinthians 11, you can see this in, first, in verses 17 to 22, even in Paul's day. He says, but in giving this instruction, I do not praise you because you come together, not for the better, but for the worse. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that divisions exist among you, and in part, I believe it. So by the way, for all of us who get upset when we see the clickiness that goes on in churches, we have to recognize one thing. We're not new to that game, right? Clicks have existed as long as social gatherings will be together, even, unfortunately, in the body of Christ. You end up congregating around the people that you feel the most comfortable with, the one you have the, the most amount of relationship with and similarity to, and you kind of set yourself away from others within the body. I don't think that couldn't happen here because it most definitely could. When I see the way people just fight over sports teams, I mean, for crying out loud, right? I'm not going to get into last week, okay? The comments I made, yeah, amen. (laughs) So, So this can happen, right? So Paul says that at first. And then he says, but there also must be factions among you so that those who are approved may become evident among you so that the truth may actually rise to the top that we may see it. Therefore, when you meet together in the same place, it's not to eat the Lord's Supper, Oh, yeah, Corinthians, I know you say it is. But what's really going on? For in your eating, each one takes his own supper first, and one is hungry and another is drunk. For you do not have houses in which to eat and drink. Or you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you? And this, I will not praise you. So not only were there cliques, 
There were people who were getting there to the meal before everybody else. Quite possibly because in that time, you didn't, well, even in our time today, I guess, what, what were those laws called? Were they called blue laws where you couldn't work on Sunday? Is that what they were called? Or am I getting that wrong? Am I right? Okay, good, good. I'm talking to the lawyer here. Um, so, so, right, places used to have to be closed on Sunday, but nowadays it doesn't seem to matter. And so we actually almost have a kind of, kind of, kind of a re-going back. That was really well said. Re-going back to a previous time. And you had Christians who would have to work on the first day of the week and others who perhaps didn't or didn't work at the same time. And so what are they doing? They're acting like gluttons. They're eating. Some of them potentially getting drunk. And Paul's saying, what are you doing? When you come together, the Lord's table is for you to consider other people's interests as above your own. Like our brother read from Philippians 2.4 this morning. That's what you're coming together for. You're not coming together so you can get your own piece of the pie and make sure you get that last slice. You're coming together to bless other people, to be in communion with one another. And as we've said here, that's hard work. Believe me, I know. And, and almost every month when we do this, I, in my mind I go, is this going to be too much this month? Because <laughs> it can be a lot. I know, and believe me, I appreciate it so much when everybody gets together and puts their effort in to get this place set up and you bring the food. And look, that can be a struggle sometimes. But communing with the saints, I'm not saying this in a cold, callous way. It is hard work. It requires our entire lives. That's why Paul says in Galatians 6, do good to all, but especially who? The household of faith, right? We should be reserving our best attitude, our best behavior, our best responses, and our most amount of love for those who are gathered in here today. And it's a shame when we don't do that. When we allow our personal conflict and disagreements and, and, and our, even our own selfishness to crowd that out. And look, if you've been guilty of that, I'm, I've been guilty of it too. That's why I'm thankful that I'm saved by grace and not how well I'm running the race. So if that was the case, I would have fell on my face. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> so anyway, so 1 Corinthians 11, 17 and 22 indicates that this was a problem even in Paul's time and the communion meals in Corinth were rife with clickiness and gluttony. But I also want to mention this. I'm, I won't camp out on this too much, but... By expanding church membership, when I, meant, when I mentioned that phrase, expanding church membership, one would be remiss if they failed to acknowledge the Council of Nicaea and its impact on distancing as much good that came out of Nicaea in terms of establishing the deity of Jesus Christ and really nailing that home. Nicaea also had an impact on distancing the now predominantly Gentile church from its Jewish roots, purposely moving the date of the celebration of Easter away from Passover in the 4th century give you a quote here from Constantine, which he wrote this to the bishops at Nicaea. Quote, It appeared an unworthy thing that in the celebration of this most holy feast we should follow the practice of the Jews who have defiled their hands with enormous sin and are therefore deservedly afflicted with blindness of soul. Let us then have nothing in common with the detestable Jewish crowd for we have received from our Savior a different way. Might I remind Constantine that that Savior was Jewish himself? I mean, I'd probably ruin his day, which calls into a question the, the validity of the faith he supposedly held. But this is part of the problem, right? Is that when you distance yourselves from the roots of something that's been done and you start introducing all these other elements, well, now you've got, you got to find a justification for it. Okay, so what does this actually mean now, Right? Well, this is where you get into some of the errors that come about from this growing distance, and it seems to have led to this embracing of a teaching that would later be called, and I already referenced it, this doctrine of transubstantiation. Now, this was something that was played around with by the 9th century AD, but really becomes official church teaching of the Roman Catholic Church by 1059 AD with the Fourth Lateran Council. Sorry, I don't mean to throw much of dates at you in names. I apologize, but I've got to do it. Fourth Lateran Council of 1215 AD. And one of the reasons why I do this, by the way, just so you know, is I know that there are Roman Catholic friends of mine who watch these messages and they interact with me. And I want to make sure that, they, that I'm putting things in the proper context. And I feel bad because they usually end up sending me this like, really well thought out, wonderful email back to me. And I'm just slow at getting back to them. But they're, they're very gracious with me. So anyway, so no longer seeing the bread and wine to be consumed in remembrance rooted in the Paschal Festival, the elements of communion, while still bread and wine in substance, 
in reality, when prayed over by a sacerdotal priest, that's a priest who is commanded by the Roman Catholic Church and given supposedly the authority to do so, when prayed over by that priest of the Roman Catholic Communion, in actuality, it becomes the real body and blood of Jesus, which must, must be re-represented during a service, which they call the Mass, where the faithful Catholic must partake of this ongoing, unfinished, propitiatory, that means in place of sin, sacrificed, lest they risk foregoing the sacrifice of Christ on their behalf and end up in hell. Yeah, that's what's going on at the Mass. So when people maybe have a bone to pick with me because I'm not as quick to walk arm in arm with Roman Catholics and consider them to be Christian brethren, this is why. That is fundamentally, not, I'm sorry, I'm not saying this to be needlessly offensive, but it's true. That is fundamentally not the Jesus of the New Testament. I'm sorry, it's not. And if I lied to you and told you otherwise, then I would be doing you a disservice. I would be doing all of you a disservice. And I have to live with myself. Now, by the time of the Reformation, in the 16th century, the Reformers and Protestants after them rejected this propitiatory nature of the so-called Eucharistic sacrifice on the basis that it contradicts the scriptures. Most notably at places like John 19.36, where Jesus declared from the cross, what? Some of you know it. It's finished. To tell us die. It's finished. A verbal form used by John to signify a completed action in the past with ongoing effects in the future. Completely debunking the need for an ongoing propitiatory sacrifice. I won't say the name of the brother in here, but you probably know who he is. And he can correct me afterwards if I'm getting his words wrong. But I remember he had said something to it. He told me he had said this to a priest one time. He said, Jesus is my high priest. Why do I got to go through you? Right? And quite frankly, that's a very good point. Well, you see, God instituted, okay. Where's that in scripture? Where's that in the Bible? Are we sola scriptura Christians? Do we believe that this is the sole, infallible, inerrant source for our faith and practice? If we do, then on that basis alone, we have to reject this teaching called transubstantiation, just as our Reformation forefathers had done. Now, this doesn't mean that all who were part of the Reformation movement agreed on the exact nature of the Lord's Supper itself, and even to this day. Case in point, Luther's view of the Supper rejected the Roman Catholic idea of it being a sacrifice, but still held on to the idea that Jesus is somehow still physically present in the elements, in a doctrine called consubstantiation, that Jesus is in, with, and under the elements. Zwingli, Ulrich Zwingli, the... the um, uh, Dutch reformer rejected this idea. Since Jesus is present in heaven, the I am passages of John are to be interpreted metaphorically. And if you just looked down them, you know, this is why our Roman Catholic friends like to camp out on this one in John 6, 35, I am the bread of life. See, if you eat his flesh and drink his blood. See, he said he's the bread. So of course that's what it is, right? Well, is he a door? Is he light? I mean, in that, in that literal sense, when Jesus was walking around, did, did he have beams coming out of him? It's metaphorical language meant to communicate a deeper truth. That's clear from the context. And only God in his grace can save and not any physical elements. That's what we might call memorialism, a memorial view of the supper. And then John Calvin in striking something of a, somewhat of a moderating position, although that's kind, of, that's kind of dumbing it down for the sake of argument, posited that Christ wasn't present physically at all, but that he was indeed present spiritually in some way. And we might call this spiritualism or even sacramentalism. Now, the Reformation, with all of its ad fontes, brought back into focus, going to the sources, going to the scripture, the key question one needs to answer when seeking the proper way to celebrate the Lord's Supper, and that is this. What do the scriptures actually teach? We just keep coming back to the Bible. And that's good. That's why we're in the spirit of the Reformation here at this church. So this leads us back to the past to seek a more biblical and therefore God-ordained practice of celebrating our collective Passover once again around the table of our Lord. So just starting to sum up here. Like I said, I know this message has been very heavy on information. So I apologize if it's been a little on the dry side. That has not been my intent. But once again, I am charged with teaching the whole counsel of God, right? And so sometimes it might be necessary for me to camp out on something like this in order to better instruct our people and then for people maybe who might visit one day or hear this later, why we do what we do, right? So what's communion's current custom? Amongst 
churches, Protestant churches, churches of the Reformation, evangelical churches, whatever we want to call that and how much we want to stretch those terms out. Um, you, you basically had this idea of sacrament versus ordinance, right? So amongst other Bible-believing churches, there's a split on this. Is what we're doing here a sacrament that provides grace from God? Or is it an ordinance that's been commanded by God in remembrance of what he's done? I think I just kind of revealed my hand. But let me just keep going here a second. Now, Reformed churches and, and those that we might call high churches. A high church is a church that's very liturgical, very much rooted in the, in, in the history of the church, very much dependent upon creeds and confessions and those kind of things. Is, you know, and, and it's not necessarily anything wrong with that. I'm just making a point. They tend to view the Lord's Supper in a more sacramental fashion in that the supper imparts actual grace to the participant, a divine blessing toward sanctification. Now, mind you, amongst churches of the Reformation, they would not teach that it actually imparts saving grace, okay? So that if you don't eat of this, you risk going to hell or something like that. That's, once again, that's the Roman camp, and that's not where we're at. That's not where we believe the Bible is at. Independent churches like our own tend towards the ordinance view. An ordinance is just something that one has ordained that ought to be followed through command. And that communion is a practice commanded by the Lord in which Christians are thereby commanded to be obedient to its observance. So which way is right? Thankfully, amongst born-again believers, these terms are somewhat used in synonymous fashion, even though it may be a little misleading. But I do believe that it's better to view communion, and this is how one Christian website put it, I thought it was a good definition, quote, a symbolic reenactment of the gospel message itself. And therefore, a God-ordained activity that was instituted by Messiah, taught by his messengers, and practiced in the early church, an ordinance for this age in which we live. So that as we take of the bread, and as we drink from the cup, we teach our children, this is why we do this. Because I was in the house of slavery of my sin, and my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ freed me from my bondage and brought me into right relationship with him. And then our children do that with their children and so on and so forth as we continue to move on. Now, by the way, this is not to say that, that this is optional. You could do this or not do this or that God is okay with his church celebrating it however they want. You know, having like wine coolers and, and uh, you know, donuts for communion bread, right? I'm not saying that at all. Well, that's kind of a gross combination. <laughs> I think about it. Ugh. Rather, it's an ordinance requiring the utmost respect and honor carrying with it true blessing of union with the saints and communion with God when practiced rightly and the danger of judgment when practiced wrongly. Now in our modern day, some evangelical churches like our own, whatever you want to call our church, independent Bible church, evangelical church, I don't know. We're, we're just Christians, right? We're just members of Christ's body. All right, well, at least we could say that. There does seem to be a movement back to celebrating the Lord's Supper in a more biblical fashion as a memorial remembrance of our redemption from sin slavery in the same vein as the original Passover festival and also an opportunity to share a meal together in the spirit of the New Testament references we've looked at this morning and in deference to the fact that this most precious of ordinances took place when? When did it take place? During a meal. During a meal. And that, by the way, was a common way to ratify a covenantal relationship after the cutting of a covenant in the scriptures. You cut a covenant, you had a meal. We see this at Sinai in Exodus 24, I think it's 24, 11, where it says that the congregation of Israel sat and had a meal as Moses was receiving the covenant on Sinai. Therefore, we at Messiah Bible Church, as a local expression of the universal congregation of the Lord Jesus, are called to be in covenant with God and with one another. Therefore, communion is more than obligatory consumption of symbolic bread and grape juice. Right? Remember, we're Baptists in spirit, so we're going to have grape juice. Where we silently hold these elements, since that's what everyone's done before us, or at least of recent time anyway. It is a call to remember the redemptive sacrifice of our Savior, to reflect upon its implications in our lives through repentant disposition and desire to draw nearer to Him, and a reassertion of our full fellowship with one another, without division and without distinction. And in this, we do believe that our Heavenly Father indeed does commune with us, our Passover Lamb having made the way for us to be reconciled, the Spirit energizing our faith as we commune in solidarity of our Messianic Christian faith together. That's why we celebrate the way we do. That's why we have a meal afterwards. 
because this is what we're called to do, to love our God supremely and to love each other too.